Hello everyone. This video is dedicated to the life work of Marnie Shepherd. Sometime between November 2020 and March 2021, Marnie passed away in Australia while on an extended camping trip. One of Marnie's closest correspondences who talked with her regularly while she was completing her doctoral thesis had the following words to share. Dr. Marnie Shepard was first and foremost a category theorist with deep interest in quantum gravity and particle physics. After reading Edward Witten's 2004 Twister String paper, she realized scattering amplitudes were best studied combinatorially with associohedra and operads. In 2007, she included such insights in her PhD thesis entitled Gluon Phenomenology and a Linear Topos. While part of the quantum computing group at the University of Oxford, she discussed with visiting scientists the application of associohedra and operads to high energy physics and quantum computing. Associohedra and operads inspired the creation of the amplitudehedron, an object that has revolutionized the study of scattering amplitudes. Moreover, Marnie also saw the power of using Alexander Grothendieck's motives to illuminate the geometrical and number theoretical aspects of quantum gravity and unified theories of physics. Her theoretical le legacy lives on and her contributions to mathematics and physics will be solidi solid solidified as category theoretic tools rewrite the foundations of physics. Okay, and while this video is not about me, I just want to say that I'm not making this video today as a friend of Marnie, but rather as a scientist who respects the, the ideas that she pursued. While I did interact with Marnie, I myself had to distance myself from her and her work while she was alive due to um, personal difficulties between us. However, I do have expertise in particle physics and the scattering amplitudes community and I've just seen many people in the community talk as though her thesis was meaningless. So I wanted to make this video mainly to provide evidence to support that there was merit in the ideas that Marnie worked on, despite how difficult she was to interact with as a person from time to time. Uh, but to start, I'm going to go through a review of where you can find her life's work in general, just because so many, so few researchers uh, have looked into this. So she had a few different blogs. Um, the main one that she wrote on most recently is Arcadian Gravity. And here's the homepage for that, arcadiangravity.techpad.com. And if you go to the about page there, there are also a list of a few other important links that give a higher, uh, an overview of where you can find various of her works, including her thesis, uh, her papers on the archive, as well as her papers on Vic stress. So if you look at the work she did, she has three papers that are on the archive from about 2003 to 2004. And she completed her thesis in 2007. And so by the time she um, had gotten banned from archive, she posted her first paper on Vixra in 2007. So if you're not searching for her thesis directly, it's hard to, to find this. And so the, a lot of people probably haven't read it for partially for this reason, because she was transitioning between archive and Vixra, which um, it can lead into some controversy. So I just want to point out that there is a precedent for topos theory being used to formulate quantum mechanics. And uh, Chris Ishin is one example of a researcher who works in this area. And of course, he has done a lot of work in category theory for many years before 2007 um, that are related to quantum gravity and space time. So I, I'm not claiming that uh, Marnie alone came up with these ideas on her own. There were others in the field that were thinking about these ideas, but uh, it, it is true that Marnie did complete 139 pages in 2007, where in general, it's difficult to, to hear people mentioning the significance of her work. And if you go to her Brixer page, she has about 28 papers from 2007 to 2020. I just figured I would highlight four or five of my favorite papers from her. 
Um, one of the earlier ones on Vixra is looking into the mass matrix transforms in qubit field theory. Basically, she was using this notion of a discrete Fourier transform to attempt to match the Coide relations. And to present day, it's not clear if the, the Coide formula is correct. We're not sure. But if, if it turns out to be correct, the only way we would have a chance of making sense of it is to use circulant mass matrices, which Marnie realized could be applied to this, uh, this Corday formula. So that, that is interesting in some regards. This paper in 2010, quark lepton braids and heterodox supersymmetry. I found this paper really interesting when I saw it, when I talked to her uh, in person at one point. And what she is basically doing here is once again, using this quantum Fourier transform, which she introduced in her thesis and applying it to braid diagrams to simply calculate aspects of the standard model. And um, she cites the Bilson Thompson model, which uses these braid diagrams. And I always found the Bilson Thompson model to be curious, but I always wished there was a little bit more. Maybe I didn't research it enough, and maybe I haven't researched it enough, but uh, I at least found Marnie's work on this to be useful and interesting because she explicitly showed how the discrete forward transform related to these braids. And she found a notion of supersymmetry in the standard model, so she claims, which sounds quite bizarre because she, it's not clear from this paper if she is even talking about heterotic strings. She's actually talking about the standard model. But I think she was attempting to pitch it to a string theory community. And since heterotic string theory most commonly uses E8 cross E8 to get at the standard model, I think she decided to label it in that way. But I would say that I don't think this paper actually directly has to do with heterotic string theory, but on the same regards, I think some of her intuition for what she was finding with supersymmetry is relevant for the standard model because uh, just in my own independent research, I found similar aspects to this. I wouldn't word it in the same way that she did, but uh, I think there's some merit to the idea in this paper. Also, um, there, there is some other work by uh, Finkelstein at UCLA who uses uh, the braid group to refer to the standard model. And it's, it's very similar to this, but once again, from a, a completely different perspective. Um, there's also this work in 2012 that is a fairly long work that goes through constructive motives and scattering. So this is really a, a self-contained text, you know, mini textbook, if you will, going through category theory with applications to physics. So I, I do find this to be interesting uh, to look back into. And you know, as, a, as a physicist, maybe you could argue that she didn't find particularly new solutions, but as a mathematician, I think she should be acknowledged for her attempt to apply new mathematics to physics in an interesting and simple way. And I mean, it's, it's in, at the time, it, it's definitely not simple mathematics, but she is attempting to use modern mathematics that is clear is going to usher in a new paradigm in physics and apply it to physics that we know and measure, such as the standard model and gravity. So she talks about various, various, various different things here. Um, and there's some interesting ideas throughout. And finally, I just wanted to bring uh, to, to you guys' attention this idea that she had about neutrinos and gravity. Um, basically, I think she thought that the right-handed neutrinos didn't really exist and were a part of space-time itself. And she had a few different papers that were related to neutrinos in, in, her, in her later life. So. I just wanted to briefly bring those to your attention. So now going back to get back to her thesis work, which is where my story kind of interacts with this. 
basically Marty was claiming that Nima Arkani Hamed should have cited her thesis and didn't because Marnie was saying that she had lunch with Nima, told her about her ideas on sociohedra, which were mentioned in her thesis in applications to scattering amplitudes. And so I, I asked Nima Arkani Hamed in person if he had lunch with Marnie, and he said, yeah, he had lunch with Marnie, um, but her ideas were vague. And at the time, I didn't really know Marnie's work very well enough to evaluate this and it is using mathematics that is pretty complicated and new so I didn't really know how to evaluate that statement but this is certainly a delicate situation and I don't think that the, this was a clear cut, cut example of plagiarism or anything like that. I think this is one of those gray scenarios uh, especially what Nima did say is that he didn't realize at the time that Stashef polytopes and associahedra were actually the same thing. So he had heard about associahedra from Marnie and then later that day had met up with uh, Goncharov who was talking about Stashef polytopes and Nima at the time didn't even realize that they were the same thing and Nima went on to collaborate with Goncharov. So if I just brought up on archive uh, all of Nima Nima's papers, and you can see, obviously he's ha he's a has a very celebrated career, and I have a lot of respect to him as a great scientist. Um, he's done a lot of great work, and so he, he's done a lot of good work related to the standard model, string theory, cosmology, building up to uh, before he met Marnie, and you can see he was thinking about similar ideas, tree amplitudes, which is what also what Marnie was talking about. So. Um, you know, obviously Nima is an expert in scattering. And they eventually got to this work looking at a duality for the S matrix, which eventually led into the study of these grassmannia and uh, positive geometries. And so you can see this is where the flurry of work really started. And by 2012, uh, Nima and Gontrov uh, started collaboration, which I'm, I'm presuming is after uh, when Marnie had lunch with Nima. So, okay, maybe maybe they should have cited Marnie. That's that's not up to me to say. But also, Gontrov has done a lot of work in this area as well. And so, if you look at Gontrov's work on archive in 2007, he's talking about this pentagon relationship relation and quantum dialogue algorithms. And it goes back. He's been talking about quantum dialogue rhythms for quite some time. So he was an expert in this area and had done more work than Marnie in this area. But um, Marnie had a precedent of at least claiming that these were useful for amplitudes. However, it was clear that these integrals that Gontrov was studied were related to quantum field theory. So as a mathematician, Gontrov didn't focus on the physics aspects until he collaborated with Nima and their other collaborators, this plethora of scientists who have done great work. So that obviously led to a lot of tension in Marnie's life because she always wished that she had gotten cited more. And I mean, at the end of the day, most scientists who pursue new ideas struggle to be understood at first. So, um, I don't fully agree with all of Marnie's perspectives, but at the same time, I do think that there was merit in what she did in her thesis. So uh, I'm just gonna go through her thesis in a, a few key highlights to kind of to demonstrate and compare with the history of the development of her claims because uh, I was able to verify that there is a precedent in the literature to substantiate her conjecture and her thesis, but this point hasn't really been clarified by anyone that I've heard talk about because there are so many different names for the same mathematical object. So it makes this discussion so difficult. So in this thesis, um, Marnie mentions associahedra a few times. Um, 
she about six times. She talks about Stashef Sosihedrin pointing out that they're the same thing. Um, I think on page, yeah, right here you can act, this is actually an example of a, a three-dimensional associahedron, which the two-dimensional version is the same thing as the MacLane Pentagon. So sometimes you'll hear it called the MacLane Pentagon. Sometimes you hear, hear it called an associahedron. Sometimes you hear it called a Stashef polytope. Um, sometimes you'll also hear it just referred to as a Catalan, Catalan number. It's also dick words. Dick words are also the same thing as associahedron. They're the same objects. So there's at least five or six different terms for the same object. And this has led to a lot of confusion and understanding how different scientists work is related. So she's, she's mentioning the Stashef associahedron. Um, by page 47, she is attempting gluon amplitudes, and she reviewed Witten's work, which was, which led to BCFW recursion, which is very important for tree-level scattering. So um, once again, Marnie is on point for talking about this work because this was, uh, Witten came out with his work in 2000. Four. So this was a very active time to be thinking about these ideas. And let's see, there is a page, maybe it's 47 up here, sorry, that eventually discussed the decomposition. Here we go, oh, sorry, page 53. Here's a corded heptagon for seven gluons. So she's describing here how to use polytopes to get at kinematic aspects of scattering amplitudes. And at this point, most people would just say that this work was irrelevant or not productive. However, I want to also point out that her thesis did more than just talk about scattering. She really defined notions of quantum logic as a linear quantum topos, which is related to insights from Isham as well. But um, I, I don't think that her thesis is just a list of conjectures or anything of this mean, I think she is attempting to derive modern physics using modern mathematics. And she didn't get into finding new solutions with scattering amplitudes with this, but she, she was correct in pointing out that Witten's twister theory work was important and that it did have a category theoretic interpretation that was related to associahedron operas. And most people would still struggle to understand if that is true and how that could be true. So I just wanted to close this by reviewing a few other advances that have happened in the scattering amplitudes community that are difficult to follow. Um, so as I was saying, by 2012, uh, Nima and collaborators had found this notion of an amplitudehedron, which used similar mathematical objects, but in a sense, this was not directly related to Marnie's thesis because Marnie is discussing classical scattering of QCD, which is a physical force known to be observed in an experiment. Whereas uh, Nima's work originally was discussing N equals four super Yang Mills theory. And they found an interesting result. They were able to get arbitrary quantum corrections in this N equals four super Yang Mills theory at least for a part of the theory, the simplest part of theory, the planar diagrams associated with this theory. So it, it first looks very impressive and it is an important work because uh, calculating perturbative corrections are very difficult. And so we, we should pursue that understanding. But it's clear that Nima's work here is just the tip of the iceberg because super Yang Mills theory has less diagrams than Yang-Mills theory at the quantum level. 
and n equals four secret angles theory has the, the least number of diagrams. And the diagrams that it has are the simplest box diagrams. So QCD, you could argue, is about 99, basically 1% of the computation time that the LHC uses to compute QCD. It, it's only it's only getting it's getting all the diagrams in super yang mills theory um, but qcd has way more diagrams that super yang mills theory does not have so in some regards marnie's scope was more ambitious so she didn't get as far because she was focused primarily on qcd whereas nima picked a smart toy model of study so he can make more concrete progress and so that that was very impressive to the community and really showed people that there was something here but Marnie was basically saying the same thing in her own way. And of course, Marnie would try to argue that this work was related directly to sociohedra, but it's, it's not actually true. However, the sociohedra did come back in Nima's work about a decade later by 2017. It was firmly established that the sociohedra described the classical scattering amplitudes of this biadjoint scalar theory. And at first glance, this might seem completely irrelevant to what Marnie is claiming, because what does biadjoint scalar theory have to do with yang mills theory or QCD? But the, the point is that what was discovered around 2017 was that this biadjoint scalar theory has solutions related to yang mills theory. So by 2017, you could argue that that is evidence for Marnie's conjecture that a sociohedra would be useful for Yang Mills theory because they are useful for calculating the amplitudes in biogenic scalar theory, which is the quickest way to calculate Yang Mills solutions, assuming you have that mapping well established, which there is a lot of progress on. And um, I actually did some research in that area, so that's the only reason I'm aware of this. And so, but also there's Another work that was done prior to this, that I, I never told Marnie about this because uh, there was no reason for me to, but I wanna share this to the world because there might be some potential for benefit here. So if you look at this paper by Tom Malia in 2013, he is using Dick words to get at a multi-quark uh, color decomposition of the amplitudes. So. He is using a sociohedra for the color numerators of QCD, which means that a sociohedra are useful for QCD, which is what Marnie was trying to say. Now, I think Marnie in her thesis connected it a bit more closely to the, the kinematic aspects, which is more related to a scalar theory as found in the biadjoint scalar theory, but uh, those solutions can be related to Yang Mills. So I think by the work established by 2013 and then followed by 2017, which found that sociohedra were describing the classical scattering amplitudes of biadjoint scale theory, which then had a double copy to Yang Mills theory. Um, this all establishes that sociohedra are useful for QCD, which is really the point that Marnie was trying to make. So in that sense, I do think there is some merit to Mar Marnie's ideas, her legacy. Um, of course, many others probably don't feel the same way as me, and that's fine. And I do think that a lot of these things would have been figured out regardless. It's not clear how much impact Marnie's work actually had on the progress, but uh, I just wanted to Stay, state that it does seem like what she was saying was at least on the right track. So with that note, uh, I'll thank you all for listening and feel free to follow up on more of Marty's work or really just, I think category theory, theoretic formulations of quantum field theory are interesting. It doesn't really matter who, which scientists came up with these ideas for helping humanity at the end of the day. Uh, I think it's best to not really have a stigma about mixing up ideas with someone's personality. Um, so I think, I hope this at least helps clear the air a little bit such that um, more progress can be made and 
hopefully this at least provides a little bit of closure for uh, how Marty's work and how her thesis fits into the modern theoretical physics community. Thank you.